Hello everyone. Today uh, I am with Jeff Tantra again and we will be talking about many things in the video description. Uh, you can check the section uh, for the description and you will see the points which we will discuss. So there will be lots of talks, EVPN, segment routing, LDP, BGP plus SPF, some routing protocols, especially in the data center and some uh, standardization efforts. SD-WAN will be there. So we will be talking those things. And uh, my name is Orhan Ergun. You can see our uh, previous video with Jeff on the channel. And don't forget to subscribe the channel for the more videos. Uh, please, Jeff, can you introduce yourself? And then after that, we will start. Hey guys, pleasure to be here. I'm Jeff, uh, uh, currently with uh, Abstra. Uh, we are the vendor of internet based networking, the first one. Uh, I'm a networking guy, I've been doing routing for 25 years, from Linux to routers. On the uh, architectural side, I built quite large networks. I worked for a vendor for almost 10 years, Red Bull Networks, Ericsson. So I've been on both sides. Uh, Another part of my life is ATF standardization, which I take very seriously and uh, been doing it for a long time. Uh, I'm uh, the co-chair of routing working group that does all of new routing architectures that looks into things that are not covered by other working group. So often we take an idea, we try to develop it, see whether there's interest, whether it makes sense technologically. And when it gets kind of more details, we either spin out new working group or send it down to, you know, more specific groups such as SPF, I say at BGP and so. We will start so, out the technical question, but I want to ask actually something. People will know you more also. So maybe you, you cannot count anymore, but how many RFC you contributed so far, do you think? Uh, including draft, probably 50-60. <laughs> nice. <laughs> okay. So people now every every uh, recording, every session, they will know you more. And um, not only IETF, actually, uh, he wrote a couple books. You wrote for the network engineers. May know it very well with Russ. Uh, network complexity. Any other book? Uh, no, that's it. Some white papers, but uh, this is the work I'm really proud of because complexity is a fascinating topic, and I think we did pretty good work on trying to explain where complexity comes from, why it never disappears, it just goes over to another side, how to deal with it, how to reduce complexity, and, you know, it's a, it's a fascinating reading. I'm not promoting the book, it's just, it's very good work, and I really advise you to read it. I know you are busy, but um, you should please start writing a bo uh, blog as well. If not book, blog post at, at, at least. As far as I know, you are not writing. So uh, I'm very reactive from this perspective. So I often react on Ivan's blogs because they are always interesting and provocative. So. <laughs> yeah, very provocative. And if anything, I keep more tweets than blogs. So I use Twitter and LinkedIn to publish some opinions, my reactions on what I see going on in the industry. Also, so yeah, let's say that uh, both of us, we are actively using uh, LinkedIn. So Jeff Tanstra or Hanagin, you can find us on LinkedIn. And now let's start uh, with the first discussion topic. What's the most common use case for eVPN in real life? Is it DCI, WAN, within the DCI or something else? So, if you look at history, eVPN initially started as replacement of VPLS. So, if you go even further back, uh, when we moved from frame relay and ATM to common LG network and in PLS, we needed to implement a technology to provide layer 2 over layer 2 transfer. Uh, so, the first technology that became available was Elixir the wire. So, and we immediately got two different standards in the industry, known as Martini and Compella, which is not accurate Compella, but his brother. Uh, both use different encoding, different encapsulations, and many different things. So we got two technologies with regards to it. So the work we continue to develop this technology to provide point-to-multipoint services, which resulted in VPLS. 
And again, we got two standards. So one by Cisco, by Luca Martini, another one deployed by Juniper and uh, some other companies. Capella, so which is in to receive two different and non-interworking implementations, which caused a lot of pain. Then we also implemented uh, Martini plus BGP auto discovery. So anyway, it was a pain to deploy. And if you were in a multi-vendor environment, you were kind of screwed. So uh, the idea to have BGP as control plane to distribute MAC addresses has been around for quite some time. It's just uh, we didn't have enough memory in control plane. We didn't have enough resource and forwarding plane to distribute all this information. So uh, I would say this idea was waiting for hardware to catch up to be actually able to deliver it. So some time ago, probably like six, seven, eight years ago, we finally started to work on eVPN, which initially came as VPLS replacement. On another side of things, there was some work done in data center to have BGP-based distribution of layer two information, uh, which was used somewhere internal to Juniper, some other places, but it wasn't really visible. And the reason was it was proprietary and there wasn't really a killer application to do it in data center. So we've built MPLS, the replacement of VPLS started. We've also uh, developed uh, E3 and point-to-point -point services on top of eVPN, so all the NES services. Uh, at this point, which was probably five, six years ago, eVPN could completely replace VPLS. So on parallel track, and in ATF known network uh, visualization overlay tree, so NVA tree, we started to work on technologies to provide transport for layer two overlay tree in data center, which resulted in a number of standards. Most well known is obviously VXLAN, less known STT, some others, and VGR. So depending on vendor, there was a number of standards. And Geneve. So, Geneve is a new one, so we'll, we'll touch upon Geneve. So VXLAN, supported by Intel, VMware, uh, and Cisco, won the battle. However, if you look at VXLAN, it's a pure data plane encapsulation. It doesn't have any control plane. So if you want VXLAN to work, you need to go and configure stuff manually. So it had data plane encapsulation, management plane, but no control plane. And EVPN was very obvious choice to distribute this information. And this is really where eVPN took off like crazy as a control plane for VXLAN. So if you look at today's data center, and unless you use some proprietary solutions such as I know, ACI, your default choice would be VXLAN for calculation and eVPN for control plane. And I would say anyone who requires multi-tenancy today and even going into Kind of ACI like scenarios would deploy VXLAN plus EVPN. So, this is where we see use cases for distribution data center. We see VPLS, so service providers use cases in the one. And DCI obviously is important because eventually you need to connect your data centers. So, EVPN provides the ability to provide interworking between VXLAN to MPLS. So you replace VNIs by MPLS labels. Protocol allows you to do that. Uh, EVPN allows you to interwork between EVPN and LTVPN. So any major vendor today provides you ability to take routing information that lives in EVPN. So type 2 and type 5 routes and kind of convert them or interwork into IPv4, IPv6 prefixes or VPN prefixes that could be transported over LTVPN. So to summarize, data center probably is the most significant use case today, because you see it everywhere, supported by every vendor. Uh, DCI, obviously, if you run it in data center, it's very convenient to use same technology within DCI as well as across data centers. And uh, service provider, classical, E-line, e services, E3 services provided by EVPN plus MPLS encapsulation. Plus MPLS encapsulation, but um, 
probably in the data center it works it, people are generally don't want to get the MPLS in the data center so VXLAN is a data plane and the EVPN is a control plane uh, I see also many people are interested with it uh, same reason MPLS they don't want to uh, deploy in the data center uh, especially towards the host uh, I got your point and I think we can move to next question uh, hopefully the answer very very uh, Fast, if so you would answer that. Genie, uh, oh, yeah. So, Genie, uh, it's been uh, ratified as we speak. So, it's been in late stages for probably a year, mostly due to security implications of using it. Uh, VMware and SXT uses Genie as their overlay protocol calculation. So, it's deployed in many places. The EVPN extensions for Genie is in very late stages. I didn't see implementation, but I believe they are coming because there's interest and it should so come see very straightforward extensions for geneve data plane encapsulation plus evpn on top of the signal so in uh, exactly the same way we do this so. without that ex extension it cannot compete with vxlan plus evpn anyway so it's must i mean it's not competing it's in addition to because you might have data center where your overlay that's run by vmware is geneve but your Underlay multi tenancy provided by the exam, for example. Hmm. So it, you will see inter working on control plane layer as well as kind of inter. It's not really inter working, it's a boundary. If you look at uh, how you would deploy VMware on a 16 2.5, you would have Geneve terminated on the edge node, VLAN hand off to a leaf switch and then the slant starting from leaf switch to provide multi-tenancy within public. Okay, let's move on. Second, yep. LDP, RSVP, and segment routing. Choose one of them and why. So let's compare them first. LDP came around a stateless addition to IGPs to distribute labels or to distribute binding. So every prefix needs a binding in order to resolve IP destination to a label, right? So what's very straightforward, pretty hacky protocol, if you ask me, still a lot of issues after 15 years in the field. However, reasonably simple to deploy. And uh, back then, there were actually two protocols competing for traffic engineering, CRLDP and RCPT. So we are not talking about RCP. We are talking about RCPT a little bit here. And also, let me clarify, so, CRLDP, constraint-based LDP he's talking about. Yeah which constraints stand for not using shortest path, but computing a path that deviates from the shortest path. Meaning you take some constraints in consideration and you compute the path of the traffic engineer. So CRLDP lost, it was a somewhat technological, somewhat political battle. But the point being, we ended up with two solutions, uh, completely connectionless, just follow SPF, provides label binding, LDP that runs on top of your IGP, and RSVP that is connection oriented. It kind of it mimics a connection because it's from head end to tail end, and it's in band signal. So you have RSVP flow that goes from head end to tail end and back. It does research reservation. It uh, signals the labels it's being allocated locally. So it's connection oriented, and even so, it's not. Hard guarantee, it provides soft guarantee to resource allocation. So if you reserve 10 gig of band, it doesn't mean that it's actually provided. You need additional means on the device to actually physically computer policers or any other such means as, to guarantee the track. Such as diff circle auto service. Yeah. yeah. So if we look at segment routing, it kind of inherits properties of both. It's completely stateless. So there's no state on intermediate nodes. Uh, it does provide us ability to do traffic engineering, but not in band like RCP. All the computations are done by a logically centralized controller. So since controller knows the topology, all the attributes, bandwidth available. So all this information is signaled by IGP today and BGPLS, which stands for BGP link state. It's an extension to BGP to signal information caught in IGPs to a controller. 
So now since controller has all the information, it can actually build logical tunnels and then signal them back to head and to instantiate them. Couple things let me add here. BGPLS is not also just carrying from the network the topology information from the link state protocols, but also uh, traffic engineering specific informations might be like SRLG, link coloring, admin uh, groups, etc. Uh, this is important to understand. IGP can still run between the controller and the network, but BGPLS, uh, you like you can think that you are redistributing all this topology information plus, plus traffic engineering in information into BGP and your BGP speaking router probably like route reflector and the controller uh, speaking BGP. Uh, let's continue. So to kind of explain why we introduced BGP LS, uh, traditionally all traffic engineering information in IGPs is carried in APEC LSA LSPs. Uh, the scope of such LSA LSP is level or an area. So the problem in this case, obviously, you need to create a logical tunnel from an IGP level or area to the controller once per a year, which doesn't scale, which painfully requires jury tunneling and all the stuff. Well, with BGP what if you have just flat design, not hierarchical design? Then you could use IGP potentially. So, but in this case, still BGP LS wouldn't provide uh, scalability compared to IGP? Uh, so BGP is better in a way it doesn't flood, right? Yeah. When you need to, BGP only sends incremental updates. And this will come up in LSDR discussion yep. as to why we are doing that, yeah. right? Yeah. So uh, I would say BGP provide, provides much better API to interact with controllers than IGP. And this is pretty much why. But you are still not saying, maybe you said flooding and it's equal to scalability as well. So scalability is on mm -hmm. one side. BGP yeah, LS so if, versus IGP. If you have controller passively participating in your network, you flood every time there's a change, right? So your controller is constantly being bumped by new information. Yeah. BGP in this uh, case also scalable. Uh, BGP LS uh, address family would be scalable yes. compared to IGP. There's some negative plus point APA. because what you de facto do, you are translating information in IGP, not translating, encoding into BGP. Mm -hmm. And if you are not doing it correctly, and I've seen the early implementations of this, uh, you get into racing conditions, uh, especially in the SAS case. It's really complex technology to do. But when implemented, it provides much cleaner. So not to forget, BGP supports policies, while IGPs don't. Right? So it gives you the ability to filter information, and it's very cleanly done by using not link and prefix attributes. So, in general, it's much easier to parse and rebuild your topology as a controller. And in fact, uh, uh, if you want to filter something on IGPs or SPFSS, you need to have hierarchical design, and hierarchical design again is losing to BGPLS. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely, because as you all know, uh, you are only allowed to filter on boundaries in IGPs, in, in link state IGPs. So, but we uh, now. Uh, we now define LDP, um, what RSPP was doing, and SR, and uh, getting benefits from both, let's say. Uh, one thing first, CRLDP, by the way, CR, uh, of course, it's now deprecated, but CRLDP was not uh, reserving bandwidth, right? It was stateless also. Uh, it was providing ability to traffic engineering, so choose the path that is not yeah, SPP, but yeah, not uh, band, not bandwidth reservation like RSVP. It was not. No. Yeah. Okay, but uh, just one word: SR, LDP, RSVP. Which one? So if that. you deploy today, you should deploy certain routes using PLS data plane. There's absolutely no reason to do LDP, uh, RSVP. I I can imagine there could be some use cases. Uh, for example, segment routing, since it removed all the states from the network, doesn't give you ability to do point to multipoint. There's some work going on, but it's, it's still to be done. So like multicast, so for example. Mature point to multipoint, like multicast. Point to multipoint, RSVPT. So if you require multipoint transport with three guarantees and all the beauty, the kind of predictability that RSVP gives you, providing almost like a physical alike path, uh, 
I can imagine recipe to be blood. Actually, big but question. Actually together with second charge. Now, big question is coming. Okay, you say for if you are deploying today, probably you are uh, saying for Greenfield, go with SR. What about already deployed LDP uh, or RSVP network? Do you think that there might be always cases, but what would be the biggest case for us to migrate to SR from LDP or RSVP? So the question, how do you use RSVPT? Most networks don't really do traffic engineering. What they use RSVPT for is fast route. Uh, I agree. Especially, I see link right? protection also with yeah. the fast route. Mostly link protection because links are most frequently failing compared compared to not failure. Yeah. Correct. So, uh, from protection perspective, segment routing gives the ability to use uh, topology independent LFA loop free alternative that gives you almost in all cases 100% coverage. It gives the ability to do link protection. It gives you ability to provide not protection. And actually, and it has properties compared to regular LFA as well as remote LFA. Yeah, also a uh, very important point there. RSVPT also can provide 100% coverage and it can provide link and node protection. But yes. TILFA is providing also post convergence optimal path, which RSVPT cannot. Or cannot guarantee that, and uh, your uh, merge points. I, I would disagree with you because yeah. your post conversion path is your backup LSP, so there's no IPT yeah. conversion site. Yeah, but so post conversion. You, you know exactly where you're going to converge to. But this is my point. Post convergence optimal path. Let's say your merge point, right? So merge point might be totally different place that you need to go to dirt that merge point then for the destination maybe you are doing hairpinning to go to destination which would be suboptimal and RSVP we are seeing this one RSVP FRR we are seeing this one a lot but uh, in TILFA case we don't see this and uh, when they really market about that post convergence optimal path we provide we need to understand that merge point might be uh, three four five different four, five hop away then you need to go to that point first from PLR, and after that from merge point to destination, you might be doing some hair pinning. So some uh, interfaces might be passed through a couple times. So uh, this might be also, of course, bandwidth consumption issue on those links uh, for unnecessary consumption. That's why I said that. What do you think? It's an interesting point because traditionally IPFRR, so LFA, remote LFA, direct LFA, they don't consider availability of resources. So you would just run something like uh, uh, for LFA, you'll just run number of algorithms to find all the loop-free paths available that are worse than your primary, but still loop-free and available. It doesn't mean that the path is actually available from resource perspective. So the interface path my go through could be overloaded. So there are many different things you need to take into consideration and think whether you are trying to protect, protect link, not or actually resources. So if you are thinking about resource and guaranteed protection, for example, you are delivering some critical service. Mm -hmm. You might start thinking about doing uh, path protection. So your backup path is fully pre-computed and pre-instantiated prior to the failure and controller really monitors use of resources and if needed recomputes the better path. Pet protection, by the way, let me just introduce pet protection for the audience. Uh, so link protection and node protection, we generally consider for the local protection mechanism. So the um, pet protection though is done by the head end and we have always one-to-one -one primary, so protection and protected pets. Primary and backup pets uh, was just Jeff talking about. Uh, any other point for this question? So let, otherwise, let's move on. Sir. Yeah, so it's important to understand what you're trying to protect and technology to implement because in our CPT case, backup tunnel could reserve resources and be as good as your primary. And segment routing case, it's really complex because you are not on the network. It's a controller that looking after resources of the changes in the network. So potentially there are some delta in time between a allocation of resources and instantiation of resources. But so 
This, you're really looking at the bus protection. <laughs> you really need to understand what you are doing. This can go very deep level, actually. But uh, like uh, I want to say, okay, ingress, different head ends, they are not aware of each other. So one head end can reserve bandwidth on one pad. Another, also maybe they are selfish router anyway, that it, another guy also will attack to that pad. And uh, there is no coordination between them and centralized uh, controller maybe will find an optimal, you know, okay, I will not allow to you. Then... Um, TE priorities will come into the picture. I know that we will discuss that. That's why. Let's move to the third question. Uh, it's probably a topic for another one hour. Definitely. How definitely. PC works, all the, you know, yeah, it all is, the permutations and computations. You know. When eVPN was first introduced, it was providing layer 2 service. But today, with additional route types, it can provide L3 VPN service as well. Is that true? And if it's the case why we still have 2547 MPLS VPNs for layer, th layer 3 service. Let's say eVPN for both layer 2 and layer 3 services. What do you think about that? It's a very good question and if you look at the eVPN RFC it defines four route types. So route type 2 which is MAC or MAC plus IP can provide IP reachability but as per host so the IP part of type 2 route is always host route, so either 32 or 128. Uh, much later, uh, type 5 route, which is IP prefix, has been introduced. And the reason for that was that sometimes you just want to route IP prefixes, not just host route that come from R or ND, right? So Type 5 routes give us functionality that's somewhat similar to LCVPN in a way you've got a VPN route that's a prefix. So it's great use case for data centers where often you need to advertise not only MAC plus IP but also SVI or IRB route. It also gives you nice abstraction and hides MAC moves. Because now you are within your subnet. As you stretch layer two, your SVI subnet is always the same, right? So from layer to host perspective, it doesn't really matter as long as you use any CAS gateway. Uh, it's less interesting on the service provider side, and all service providers have deployed 2547, right? On another side, we spent probably 10 years in technology building all the optimization around LTVPNs. So from this perspective, I would say that at high scale, LTVPN scales better than EVPN this type 5. And we are talking about service provider use case. On data center side, I don't think you really need LTVPN today. And uh, strictly speaking, LTVPN requires labeled next hub. Obviously, there's workarounds for UG, some other stuff, but it's not native. For EVPN, however, it's built into the protocol that your next hop, which is your VTEP or any other termination point, is just a remote IP address. It doesn't have to be labeled. So EVPN natively better support data center or IP environments than LTVPN. So, but so uh, which means? To answer your question, if you do it at scale and server provider environment, I would argue that LTVPN are still better approach. But if you are thinking data center, Probably you don't need anything else but eVPN. Okay, now the, what you are saying, eVPN can provide both layer 2 and layer 3 VPN services. And for the data centers, we don't need MPLS, LDP, etc. for that because anyway, we have the VTAP reachability. And uh, for the service provider, you are saying more scalable would be L3 VPN. And I would say why. So just from uh how protocols build from implementation perspective, if you're thinking about millions of IP addresses and VPN services, uh, LTVPN as a protocol, as an implementation, at least on Cisco Juniper, scales better than eVPN. Uh, are you talking because for the VPN labels, we can advertise not per IP address, but per VRF, per CE, etc. as well, or any other point? I mean, for all practical reasons, you could do similar things for eVPN, you could optimize it. And eventually, I believe the difference will disappear. But looking today, and yeah, I'm not working for 
router vendor anymore, but talking to some Juniper people, the Cisco people, I'm just passing you information I've gathered. If you want to do LTVPN service scale, so LTVPN is still better technology than TVPN. Uh, but if scalability is not my concern, I can do whatever I am doing with the 2547 or I, I think up to the time of 4364, I can do yeah. whatever with them with the uh, EVPN today. Route type 5 is there. I can. Yeah, so if you have EVPN deployed and your use case is not massive multi tenancy, like thousands of VRFs, uh, you might seriously consider doing EVPN. Wow. And yeah. again, it has to do with how your operational folks are looking at it, whether you are familiar with the VPN enough to troubleshoot it, because it's quite different than. And don't, don't forget, EVPN is inherently switching, it's not routing. So even when you route, there's still some stuff you are doing, like you need a uh, router, MAC address, you need things that are needed in background to make the technology work, right? So the operational practices are somewhat different. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Is it true that standardization for the ISAS comes before OSPF in IETF? We see many network operators choose ISAS because of that. What do you think? So it's a religious discussion, but let's look at the history. Uh, traditionally, ISAS was taken by service providers, while OSPF was taken by enterprises. And we almost had two vendors, or actually Cisco before, then Juniper came in, and uh, feature sets were really diverse. The enterprise features went into OSPF, while service provider use cases went into ISS. Then we had a number of rewrites within Cisco of both protocols, and it had to do a lot with really bad quality of first implementations. And uh, then we had UUNet IS701 deploying ISS at really large scale, and all the bug fixes that came in, and the fact that this became the point where service providers started to deploy ISS at scale. Uh, some reasons were OSPF is an IP protocol. ISIS inherently runs at layer two. So presumably more secure. I would argue it's not, but you could say if you cannot attack it on IP layer, it's more secure. Remote attacks are possible, impossible for the ISIS, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So another point, uh, traditionally, OSPF could only be extended by changing LSS, which is the major building block of the protocol. While ISS from the beginning was deployed design using TLVs, so which are much more flexible. So extensions to ISS are much easier or were much easier than before. Uh, about four years ago and driven by segment routing, we published an RFC, I've got a number here. Which, you know, uh, For what? Seven, let me see. Architecture? We've published RFC 7684. OSPF U2 prefix link attribute advertisement, and it really helped us a lot with segment routing. But in general, what we did, we made OSPF similar to ISS to use uh, TLVs for APEC data. So as of today, when you extend both protocols, the procedure is very similar if you use APEC types. Uh, so what else? Uh, I would I would say that actually, like we have uh, we. We always had uh, type 9, 10, 11 LSAs, which uses TLV any, anyway. So why this 76, uh, you said, RFC, why it came? Uh, because you needed to be able to provide additional encodings and data to prefixes to all regular information that you would normally transport in LSAs. And this is exactly what we did in segment routing. Mm -hmm. So all the additional information that needs to be carried together with basic reachability is utilizing those additional uh, TLVs. For the SR, what type of things you are talking about? Like SR, for the SRV6 case, are you talking? Because no, no, uh, SRMPLS. SRMPLS. So this is actually what pushed this RFC. Uh -huh. It's really segment routing use cases. We've been trying to convince AC Linden, who is the chair of OSPF working group for probably the last 40 years to do TLVs in OSPF, but, you know, <laughs> he 
<laughs> he was disagreeing. Segment routing was really the use case to extend OSPF more. And last point, but very important one, with regards to IPv6, if you do OSPF, you need to run a completely different protocol, OSPF 3 ISS does support uh, uh, V4 and V6. It has properly implemented MT. And actually, some time ago, myself and Uma Chinduri, we published a draft that talks about all the considerations you need to make if you want to deploy multi topology. Uh, I'll send you the link. Okay. It's actually in the green. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is pretty much why today, when you see features, usually there is a gap of few months, at least on vendor side, when you implement SS versus OSPF. And it's really usually dependent on who is driving the solution in ITF. So if you see people like Les Ginsburg or Stefano Privedi, they are ICS folks. So for them, it's really natural to do ICS first, or Tony Lee. If you see people like Peter Cerna or AC doing this, they are OSPF people. So you know it's like for your first language. You'll just by default pick up whatever you're familiar okay. or better familiar with. Okay, got it. So it's kind of funny in a way, but it is what it is. We cannot exactly say then ISAS would be first than OSPF. Depends on who is starting. Yeah. Okay. And usually it's really driven by customers on the vendor side, right? So if my large customer is OSPF and he is paying for this new feature, probably he would do OSPF first. <laughs> Even RIP first. <laughs> Uh, you know, whatever brings money. <laughs> so another question. Uh, this one related with the data center routing. Uh, not everyone may be familiar with, and probably we will do other uh, meetings with Jeff as well as with the other data center routing guys like Tony P, etc. But let's at least high level let's discuss this one. But for the individual specific to DC routing meetings we can discuss in much more detail uh hope jeff also joins uh jeff tony uh myself we can do also three of us as well it would be great now this question what is bgp plus spf in the data center is it replacing bgp best best selection decision with spf if it's doing that which part of the bgp is used in this protocol bgp plus spf so as usual we will take a step back so uh, three years ago, we started to look into what's needed to be done for data centers. Uh, both link state protocols had severe limitations with regards to flooding, because data center is densely connected graph, so everybody is flooding to everybody. And in reasonably large graphs, it creates a problem and constantly you know, churning stuff and updates that's waiting in the queue. So it didn't really work. So this led to kind of publishing of RFC 7938, which is BGP in large GC by Peter Lopukhov and a number of other folks. And it practically became a standard in data centers. So most people who deploy a protocol for underlay today would deploy BGP. Right? And the design is really based on this RFC and it's great work. Actually, we published it in the routing working group. Put this first. Uh, so what happened back then, uh, we kind of came together with a number of hyperscalers. So Yandex participated in this work, uh, Peter Lopkop participated, who is now at Facebook, some other people. And we published a requirement draft. So what do we need a routing protocol to be, to look like, to scale like, in order to be able to address large data centers? Uh, so we published 00, zero draft that stated 00, zero next part. You can still find it online. So it defines kind of scaling characteristics, uh, some other things. And as end result, two solutions came out. One of them was Rift, which I'm a chair of. So another work is LSVR. And this is how LSVR became the working group. So if you look at LSVR, what it does, it uses BGPLS, so it's not just BGP Unicast, it's actually BGPLS. Traditionally, BGPLS was only used as a transfer. You transport your IGP data from a router to a controller. What LSVR does, however, it 
not only uses BGPLS and additional SACIs, that's BGPLS SPF, to transport this data across nodes, it also uses SPF to compute the best path. So the best path selection in BGP has been completely replaced by SPF. So, so SPF alike. <clears throat> so we don't uh, look at FAS pet origin meta set anymore. Yeah, so what you have is all the goodies of BGP, so it's TCP based, with the transmission and TCP security. You've got incremental updates. What, so what about loop button. prevention in this case? Sorry? Loop prevention. What what you will do with loop prevention if it's not AS pet? Uh it, it is actually, but it's still BGP. Still BGP, ASPET is there, but and for the loop prevention, yeah, no, it will be used? BGPLS, BGP if you look at what it gives you, it gives you pretty much LSDB, it just encoded differently. Uh -huh. It gives you all the nodes, all the links, all the prefixes. So internally, you represent, it's different than LSDB of classical protocol, but data is exactly the same. You, you've just replaced IGP by BGP. Okay, but now loop prevention, for example, is done by BGP's own ASPT attribute. Okay. No. So since you're distributing your link state, your Dijkstra is in charge of computing loop prefaces, right? So you use exactly the same algorithm you would use in OSPF or SAS to compute a loop preface mm -hmm. destination. Short. So it's not based on IS path anymore. It's based on Dijkstra. Cool. Okay. Because in the first, when you said ASPET uh, still there, so I thought it is also used for the uh, loop-free path, finding a loop free No, it's not. Okay. Since ASPath is a mandatory attribute of BGP, it has to be there. Mm -hmm. But it's not used to compute loop-free path. So you just replaced phase one and two and three in BGP best path selection by running Dijkstra. Mm -hmm. This is. This is the replacement. DGP interesting. Whenever we use it for some reason, we are playing with a lot. Oh, it reminded me a lot of things, BGP Security Confederation. For example, in Confederation, we are using BGP ASPET attribute for the loop prevention, but not for the best selection, interestingly, <laughs> in Confederation. Yeah, so uh, there are two documents. One is kind of core spec of LSVR, another one is applicability statement to LSVR. They explain the logic, the use cases. There are actually, some of them are really interesting because it's applicable not only to data centers but also to service providers. You could combine BGPLS as the kind of controller API and BGPLS SPF as reachability distribution protocol. So, so couple if you questions. are into the kind of stuff, it's pretty interesting. I would really advise you to read it. Couple, it's a well-written document as well. Couple question now. Yeah? For the BGP yeah. plus SPF, when we say that BGP, actually BGP LS plus SPF. Yes. Okay. Uh, let's move on. Mm -hmm. So the other family is uh, the IP is BGPLS, the SATI is BGPLS SPF. So only the SATI has changed in order not to kind of uh, not to break BGPLS. So uh -huh. they use different SATI because there are some additional attributes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so another, another question. Thing, a lot of testing and some deployments. Uh, and again, if there's more interest, we can invite Kiyo and Kiyo will be happy to. To tell us what's going on. Okay, a couple questions. LSVR, in LSVR, do we have only BGP plus SPF or any other work in LSVR? Uh, there's some work that's going on on uh, auto discovery. Okay, uh, and another question. For the Rift and the LSVR, we have two different working groups, right? Yeah. Rift RFC is not published yet? No. So both Rift and LSVR core specs are in ILG review, so it will take a you know, number of months for both specs to be published. And for both From implementation perspective, Rift has been implemented on uh, Juniper and shipping. There's also Python-based uh, package that's working. On the LSVR side, there's Arcus implementation. And, uh, I think Nokia was doing something, I'm not sure. Any real-life deployments are you aware? Uh, you should talk to vendors who ship it. I, okay. yeah, it's not mine. Okay, got the point. Maybe they can answer when they join. Next question. And yep. after maybe next question, we can also 
finish this recording as well. We will have a couple more questions, but we always have another meeting. So can you talk about uh, different type of RFCs? There is informational RFC, experimental RFC, standard RFC. Please define them. And can you talk about differences? Absolutely. So uh, if we are talking about standard protocols and any new proposals that requires changing, changing to, change, changes to them would be a standard track RFC. It has to be ratified. If you're asking for new code points, any new information, uh, there's a process to request this from Ayana, and Ayana would allocate them to you, which prevents what we call squatting of points. So someone else building some other solution won't get the same points building something else. So there's a very strict procedure to do this, and standard track RFCs go through meticulous number of reviews uh, as a working group document, and then when we decide to do last call before they become RFCs, every area within ITF will do the review, AD will do the review, and this is usually where a lot of work coming in because suddenly not only routing people reviewing your solution, but also security people, application people, in area people, and you are getting questions you would never imagine you would get, especially with security people. I, 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 I am having now little bit hard time to get the point you said for the standard RFCs, if we are work, if we are working on the standard protocol uh, but might be some greenfield so totally new protocol or you are writing a document which uh, for the existing protocol it might be maybe standard protocol let me give uh, one example why for example EIGRP 7868 is information RFC EIGRP Cisco is proprietary, and why not standard? So in general, uh, in most working group in area, in routing area, we require at least two implementations. So if it's single vendor implementation, it's not good enough for a standard to become an RFC. Specifically to EIGRP, it was done for historical reasons. So actually, I would argue it should have done a historical one, not information. But anyway, it's for you to read and know what's going on. Very good example is 7938, which is BGP and large DC. It was published as a informational RFC. Why? Because it describes architecture. It doesn't change any protocol semantics. It doesn't bring anything new. So the architectural documents are usually published as a informational RFC. So uh, you mean even 8402 segment routing architecture is it the information? It's an yes. architecture. Okay. So uh, experimental ones, usually completely new work that is that is considering considered interesting enough to work on, but not maybe to be deployed. So best example here Lisp. is three. Uh, sorry, not uh, beer. Beer and Lisp so, as well. So when we started with Beer, uh, there was really a lot of interest. Yeah, it's a great technology, actually. I agree. Yeah, so, but the agreement was we start as experimental. We don't know how it's going to develop. There are significant changes to data plane, to silicon. So maybe it's just, you know, academical work. So as time progressed, and we finally started to see really a lot of effort and upcoming implementations. The agreement with the routing ID was to convert it to standard track. But in general, if we do something really completely new and it's unclear whether it's going to become a technology, I will just say, you know, a bunch of RFCs, experimental sometimes is the right thing to do. There's also different requirements with regards to IAN allocations, with regards to how you get hard resources allocated to your protocol. So things like, uh, I don't know, UDP port and others, right? So it's much easier to publish an informational RFC than standard track RFC. Because uh, there are less string of requirements. What I remember, Lisp is experimental RFC, and many network, even production network, deployed it. Uh, why then it didn't become a standard track? I'm not sure. And by the way, I don't think there's anyone but Cisco doing Lisp. I know there are a number of startups. 
and the uh, Dina Farina actually contributed his code base to free range routing, but for the rest, it might actually, I don't know. Actually, also, I will say that FRR, so free range routing, is supporting the IGRP as well. Cisco and FRR can be two. Why not then? It's not standard way. So, open source is not counted? Uh, usually, it is. Okay. Actually, if open source implementation supports something, it always counted towards an implementation. Mm -hmm. But somehow, it's informational. So, theoretically, you know, if it's really important, you could go back to ATF and respin the this version that's a standard. Mm -hmm. okay, but it, it's a lot of effort and you know a lot of people consider it's not worth. You've got an RFC number and most people don't understand the difference between whether it's information or experimental standard. They just look at the number. Okay, then one more question let's get. Uh, where do you see BGP peak, BGP prefix independent convergence yep. would be most useful? VPN, I think MPLS VPN, Internet Edge, Data Center, WAN, DCI, where? Which we pick? So, uh, number one, there's a drop in routing working group area that is actually BGP peak. We are going through latest stages. It's an informational document written by Cisco Pop. So it really describes Cisco implementation with regards to hierarchical peak, how fast lists are look like, and it's actually SR19. It's the uh, SR implementation. Uh -huh. So it's well written. Uh, you've got very good shepherd for it. Uh, so if you want to better understand how PIT works, really go and read the draft. It's really good. Mm -hmm. So with regards to where to use it, for PIT to work, you always need a secondary next hub. That is a backup. Right? What PIT does, and in Ericsson we call it a double barrel, it creates a double next hop structure where prefix points into not physical next hop but intermediate entity and we refer to that as hierarchical fib yeah so when a primary next hop disappears you don't need to change all the million routes that were affected you only need to flip pointer to the secondary next hop mm -hmm. and this is really what hp does right independently of number of routes it's a simple operation to move to backup route. Mm -hmm. uh, what's important here is, as we said, to have secondary next hub, which is typical edge scenario or dual connected uh, C to P scenario. So you'll have a prefix advertised by two Ps, and you could load share in normal scenario, but you would also build a structure that provides faster route facilities such as P. So uh, as you know, BGP by default will only give you the best path. Yeah. So how do we deal with it? Uh, in classical LTVPN scenario, different Unity RD. uh, different RDs give you ability to differentiate between same prefix. So in this case, if you have router vector in between, it will still send both next hop for a prefix because uh, RDs are different and since and these are different prefixes configured different. So and you end up with the diff unique uh, VPN prefix. Route traffic driven will not do the uh, comparison yeah. between them. Okay. So in a lot of large service providers, it's considered best, best practice, and any multi-home C will be done in this way. Even for the same yeah. customer, by the way, Jeff is talking. Mm -hmm. Even for the same oh, yeah. customer uh, VPN, I'm when this, about same yeah, 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 but just uh, for the later on audience when they listen, let them understand better for for vpn cases talking we have rd rt two attributes uh, actually rd is value and rt is uh, bgp community but the uh, rd route distinguisher is even for the same customer on different pe's of the uh, customer so customer vrf on different pe we call it unique rd per vrf per pe approach so when we assign uh, ip prefix of the customer is becoming a VPN prefix and even if you have not full mesh VPN network but route reflected VPN RR, uh, when RR gets it, it gets unique. RD makes unique VPN, that's why two different VPN prefixes and advertise to other internal PEs and other internal PEs install into correct VRF because installing from BGP into VRF is not done by RD but RT, so on and so forth. So we just summarize that v for the VPN case you are defining for VPN, it's obviously beneficial peak there for the convergence. 
My question also, what about internet? So internet is different case, and while that in VPN you always have a tunnel, right? So it's either in TLS or any other technology. However, you guarantee that there is a path from ingress to egress and it's loop free. Internet, yeah. however, or before we see unicast, uses per hop routing. Uh -huh. So the right solution there is to use Edpath. Edpath is a technology that gives you ability to provide more than best path. So from computation perspective, if you look, you will do a normal best path, you will run, which will yield a best prefix. What you do with Edpath, you will remove the best prefix. It's already there, it's going to be sent to your neighbor. You will rerun best path again, and you second prefix and third and fourth as, as many as you wish, right? There is significant overhead associated with it because now you're running more computations, you're advertising more prefixes, and memory-wise, you are consuming really a lot of more memory. And it also takes longer to propagate this information. However, now you are getting not only single prefix next hop, you are getting as many single prefix unique next hop as you ask your BGP to compute. So in this case, it provides you ability again to have this hierarchical structure where you point not to the physical next hop, but to virtual next hop or logical next hop. And by doing so, you could provide equalized functionality. So why are we doing this to begin with? One of the most expensive operations on the router is downloading routes from ribbon to feed. So you look into any modern when, expensive router, you are talking about maybe 100k seconds. You look at something less advanced, a switch, something that's running you know, Sony, you are talking about thousand or less prefixes per second. Mm -hmm. So imagine you need to update 20 million prefixes in VPN. So it will take you just like four minutes to convert to just download prefixes that change from RIP to your forwarding. So all those four minutes, you will be looping traffic, you will be dropping traffic, you will be black holing traffic. So PIC gives you ability to just flip next hop and hence be independent of number of prefixes. So this is this is where the name is coming from. Prefix independent conversion. Okay, so okay. there's one or middle prefix. Before you go more, let me ask a few questions there to clarify. Rip to FIP, you said rip to FIP download of those prefixes is expensive. What do you mean expensive? Are you talking about convergence point of view? I'm talking about time. Time, convergence point of view. So it will take time yeah, so. for of course number of prefix when it grows, it will take much more time, you say. And with the peak when we have the uh, BGP peak it's like using active and let's say hot standby so they are already programmed into the both rip and fib so we can just change the fib pointer when there is a detection of the primary next of failure let's say but uh, so far uh, I was taking note while you yeah, not in my brain while you were talking MPLS case you define unique RD per URF per P uh, and we don't need in this case add pads or there are a couple other stuff like shadow route reflector yeah, so etc. What, what you could do also for VPN cases is best external. Yeah, best, so best ex external is a really nice technology. It's very simple. So normally when you receive a prefix and you've got two endpoints, one of them will win due to some administrative metrics or better uh, local preference, some others. So what's going to happen? the node that's lost will withdraw the prefix. So end result, the ingress device will have only one single next hop. So no yeah, backup. Yeah, backup. even if but co using that, even customer but might want, even, I, I, even so. customer might, might want to use active standby setup. So maybe with the community, they are sending prefix and then uh, they are changing our local pref. So we are, uh, preferring one of them and best external will allow us to advertise that second link but uh, my point best external even uh, might be required if you are using unique rd per vrf or pe or adpad or shadow or any mechanism because if there is uh, if actually let me come to conclusion if route reflector for example is not choosing the best pad other than igp cost to the bgp next stop 
you you may need the GP based external in any case because otherwise yeah, so, yeah. go ahead go ahead correct. so there's a number of technologies that could be used in combination with each other exactly uh, you need to understand complex so Edpath is a complex technology and it eats really a lot of memory and if you think about millions of prefixes you should really think about what you're doing oh now that's very big question now coming okay uh, in both uh, cases, when you say BGP pick as well, so somehow we send the two next stop, two BGP next stop for each and every prefix, and now we are multiplying the let's say resource usage, memory usage, let's say, with BGP at pet. Uh, my requirement is just maybe I have three, four, five, ten different pets, but my requirement, let's say, just to have phase three route. So only two next stop is enough for me, not maybe optimal routing, so I need to send 10 of them or without BGP optimal route reflection. So just two of them I send with the BGP at pet or unique RD, still two. So from my perspective, BGP peak and BGP at pet from the resource consumption point of view would be the same result with BGP peak two pet, whatever protocol, whatever technology you are using, unique RD per VRA per PU or shadow RR or BGP at pet. Uh, I want to understand why you are seeing B Okay, I, I can understand BGP at pet is complex, so you need to touch both route reflector and client to understand this pet identifier. But uh, why it should consume more memory with BGP at pet compared to BGP peak? So if you look at uh, separate RDs, if you look at kind of internal data structure perspective, there's just it's a it's usually implemented on uh, in routing code as a Radix tree. So it's not complete copy of everything. It's just uh, an attribute that's different, and it could be really compressed in terms of memory usage. Got you. With AdPass, you, add, you get completely new route, so you duplicating every time. And this is where the difference comes in. If you just one route, you are talking a few bytes, right? For, for this thinking, answer, I want to kiss you now. <laughs> if, you, if you think million routes, suddenly it becomes gigabytes of, of memory, course. right? So, and you. time to transmit them. Got your point and it was a really nice discussion. We, I think, audience, now we have also some live audience here. Uh, guys, do you have any question? We can maybe get a very short one, two questions. Uh, otherwise, hope you enjoy. Too many smart people on this channel. Uh, we have only one smart people there. Jeff is there, so. <laughs> Go, if, do you have any comment, any question? Otherwise, yeah. Uh... yeah. Hi, hi Jack. Uh, thank you for your time. Fantastic session. Uh, regarding LDP and second routing, uh, for Brownfield uh, PLS based on LDP, uh, does it work it to propose a migration to second routing, or it should be better they, they keep or maintain the uh, LDP uh, structure of labeling? And for Greenfield, uh, for a new background, so uh, the proposal should be uh, segment routing for Greenfield and Brownfield LDP based, just to stay with LDP. So the migration from LDP to SR is very straightforward. Actually, we spent a lot of time thinking about how to do it because there are very few Greenfields in general. So we've introduced the concept of mapping server. What mapping server does, it takes an LDP binding and maps it into seed. So you could run the same network and have boundary. Or actually, the interesting point, the server itself doesn't have to be on the boundary. It could be anywhere. It just takes LDP and converts it into segment routing, which gives you a really nice way of seamlessly transitioning from LDP to SR. So you don't have to do make before break or break before make. You actually. What you do, you deploy a SAR next to LDP. You've got administrative distance on every routing vendor that really defines which protocol in read is going to take precedence, right? So you've got your uh, administrative distance for a SAR versus LDP. And when deploying and testing, you would prefer LDP routes first. If you look at console plane and everything is working, you're happy, you understand what it does to your network. At one point in time, you just clip administrative distance from LDP to SR. It works, you switch LDP out. 
if you de de design your network in a way, I'm going to run LDP in one area and SR in another area, you could still use mapping servers to provide the mapping. Potentially, you could also use BGP LS with extensions to SR to provide the information about prefixes between networks. So, uh, spent a lot of time thinking about migration and SR is very well thought from this perspective. You could run it in parallel at six in the night. You could run it uh, like in peer-to-peer -peer fashion. There are pretty much any scenario that you can imagine it's really addressed. So like first first case, Gerardo, remember we were talking about like OSP places, migration and running shipping denied both of the protocols, then admin distance. You just described that as an analogy we can give that. Hopefully you got the point. Yeah, certainly it's exactly the same analogy. You use administrative distance to prefer one yeah. protocol over another. Yeah. But be careful really? about the resource consumption, by the way, for that when, whenever you do, especially for the IGP migration case. It might it may be for the LDP SR. Yeah, whenever you have uh, shipping denied first one of the design considerations should be uh, what about resource usage will I have any problem just make sure about that uh, uh, Jeff hey, I got another question um, regarding um, Lisp and VPN right so in, in data centers we have uh, as you said as you pointed out the XLAN plus uh, VPN so when we go uh, to, for example, a, a well-known uh, architecture, which is software-defined access, they use the XLAN plus LISP for enterprise networking. So we're talking about the XLAN in enterprise, they are using LISP as control plane, and for, the, for data centers, they, they are using VPN. Could you, your, you know, for your experience, point out for us why maybe Cisco decided to, to, to bet on LISP for, for this kind of software defined enterprise networking. So uh, I was, was I clear? Yeah, absolutely. And the answer is very clear. Cisco is the only vendor that supports <laughs> LISP. <laughs> Meaning if you, deploy, if you deploy LISP, you are, you know. <laughs> yeah, vendor <laughs> lock in, man. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm not going looking. to kind of into details while one technology is better than another one, but you should always consider cost of locked in. And if you deploy LISP, you are fully locked in. There's no way you deploy another vendor. The cost of migration is huge, and obviously your vendor is going to abuse the situation. And you, you, so. you, you cannot hear Jeff in any other place like talking like this right away. You are lucky and get the, getting the answer like this. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, so if you have uh, sorry, one question. Make sure you deploy technologies that support it at least by number of vendors. So it's a very serious consideration and also, your relationship with your vendor might change significantly if you deploy something that could be uh, purchased by more than one vendor. I think there is uh, one more question. Sorry. Go ahead, Wait. Hi, Jeff. Hi. Uh, okay. Uh, I recently joined to the meeting. Uh, sorry to for missing all the uh, discussions. But uh, to complete Gerardo's uh, question, uh, Cisco always uh, claims that uh, with least you can achieve a, a speed of uh, resolving next stop or any uh, next beta. For example, they claim that when you implement BGP and VXLAN, uh, EVPN and uh, VXLAN, uh, you uh, always advertise anything to road reflectors and road reflectors advertise to other nodes. But with LISP, uh, only the needed uh, VTAP uh, I, uh, prefixes are uh, advertised to any uh, nodes in the network. So, uh, and uh, for example, they uh, can, uh, they put an example for IoT. They uh, said that, for example, one million address, uh, every node doesn't need uh, to uh, learn all the okay. prefixes in the network. Did so, with this. You can build a database uh, uh, based on your uh, locations, not uh, full, fully on your network. BGP can do that anyway, by the way. So, yes, but they claimed it. Uh, my, this is my question. Cisco claims uh, not. It's no. very biased explanation, right? So, uh, this provides a lot of optimization in a way it caches, in a way it distributes information. Uh, with regards to BGP, 
Turtle, you don't have to use router capital. You could use EBGP or EBGP, which is very valid design. But practically, we are talking about half a second time. Do you really care? I mean, is it really important to the degree that you will go and deploy completely new technology? So the problem statement is unclear to me, saying that EVP on a slow is just simply not true. It is very, very fast. Saying that Lyft is more efficient is true, but the question, do you need this efficiency? Also, we can do with BGP this efficiency as well. If you interpreted this one wrongly, maybe, Wahid, it might be, because you said, I think, Lisp can only do this. Uh, so what you are saying, basically, Lisp is not distributed. Yeah, this has authoritative server idea, this MRMS. So, but uh, still you can do this with the BGP as well. We have, if you cannot do with the outbound route filtering, we have RT constraint. So Absolutely. we, we yeah. don't have to push every prefix everywhere. P is just can say, yeah. I want this, I want that. So I don't think Cisco would say that. I, is it Cisco? Maybe some Cisco engineers may not know the, all the technology details, or they might say. Uh, otherwise, I totally in agree with Jeff. Uh, that was in the page build day that I recently saw in uh, their uh, videos. Uh -huh. But also, uh, I think uh, your uh, point, uh, Orhan, is make uh, some complexity because you uh, must uh, do some road filtering or prefix filtering but with this uh, day client and uh, sorry the engineer client that uh, it's become easier and faster so you are bringing uh, extra notes and, and all exact, those you are bringing the extra exact notes. example is uh, on iot services uh, especially I need to watch exactly what you are, what they are saying in the video uh, to say more. But as I said, we have uh, already BGP there and even maybe other protocols. We are not saying this shouldn't be used or something, but most important point, know that you will be vendor locked in. And if you are okay with that, if you are already Cisco shop, for example, go for it. But uh, just know. And whenever actually I talk about uh, other protocols, Cisco, preparatory protocol, answer same. OTV, you might be using it. Great technology also for for me. Uh, OTV is providing those R proxies and many other features. That's fine, but you will be vendor looking. Just know that when you compare VPLS with the OTV, just remember that. And also there is eVPN now we have. So know each one of them uh, pros and cons, and then decide. Uh, let's finish, Jeff. What uh, you want to say as a last? Thank you. So I would like to say everybody for your time and interest I, I really enjoyed the discussions and hopefully we'll continue to having them for a very long time we'll bring more people yeah and uh, get connected on linkedin if you have any questions i'll be more than happy to answer them do get involved in atf it's probably one of the best decisions i made in my life reasonably early but i'm still enjoying it uh if you don't understand the process you don't understand how to join uh just let me know, I'll explain it. It's very, very easy. We are a very democratic organization. Okay. And Next time, I maybe. I to see you soon again. Next time, maybe also uh, very briefly, we can discuss how, how you can get connected with the ITF process, guys. Uh, Jeff is the best resource for that. Uh, and we can help how you can get on board. I want to also uh, thank you. And we will definitely continue to do this kind of session with Jeff. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel and get the notification. You will get the notification first. You can connect with us on LinkedIn, Jeff Tanstra. You see the name already there in the video and in the description as well. It will be uh, written there. And you can also connect with me as well. I'm using LinkedIn. And bye for now. Thanks. Thanks Have a good evening. Bye.